Thank you for joining us today for this COVID-19 uh, briefing. Our first speaker today will be Dr. Bruce Dart from the Tulsa Health Department. Dr. Dart, you have the floor. Thank you, Brian, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, today, we are reporting an additional 443 Tulsa County residents who have tested positive for COVID-19. That brings us to a cumulative total of 65,555 people who have tested positive in our county. Good news is that 60,688 have recovered. There are currently 4,261 confirmed active cases of COVID-19. Since our last press conference on January 21st, 88 more Tulsa County residents have died from COVID-19, including six deaths being reported today, bringing the total number of deaths in Tulsa County to 606. This is very sad. The emotional toll on, on everyone has been tremendous. And remember, all these cases have, have loved ones who are hurting. Um, as COVID continues, I'd like to give you a little update on Tulsa County data. By February 4th, a little more than 10% of the entire Tulsa County population have tested positive for COVID-19. Based on the previous week data, we are averaging 402 people per day being diagnosed with COVID. The average number of new cases per day is similar to the average in mid-November and appears to be decreasing. If the current slowing trend continues, it will take about two weeks before we reach 11% of the population in Tulsa County testing positive. Our cumulative case is 10,036 per 100,000 population. And put it another way, um, for every 100 people we have in Tulsa County, 10 have tested positive. During the week of January 17th through 23rd, there were 2,559 cases identified as having symptom onset or confirmed with a lab test if asymptomatic. There were 45 deaths reported this week, which is the second highest death toll to date. For the week of January 24th through January 30th, there were 1,917 cases identified as having symptom onset or confirmed with lab tests of asymptomatic. There were 46 deaths reported last week, making it the week with the highest death toll in Tulsa County to date. The 18 to 35 age group continues to comprise the majority of cases with more than 30% of cases last week. Children aged five to 17 made up the next largest age group with 17 point 0.5% of cases last week, followed by the 50 to 64 age group with 17.4% of cases. 40% of Tulsa County residents hospitalized with COVID-19 are under the age of 65. The city of Tulsa accounted for 50%, 52% of all new infections within Tulsa County. Broken Arrow accounted for 20% of those cases. Jenks, Owasso, and Bixby accounted for 5% each and no other county municipality had re represented more than 5% of the cases. Um, regarding vaccine, THC continues to administer COVID-19 vaccine to eligible individuals in Tulsa County. Under the Oklahoma priority framework, all healthcare workers, first responders, and Oklahomans over 65, are, 65 and over are eligible to receive COVID-19 vaccine. The supply in Tulsa County is dependent on the federal allocations from the federal government to the state of Oklahoma. The state then makes the allocation to each county. According to the Oklahoma State Immunization Information System, or, or OSIS as we call it, THD has administered 24,053 vaccines to date, which includes 47,013 second doses. There have been more than 77,100 uh, doses administered in Tulsa County and documented in OSIS as of February 2nd. Yesterday, we learned the state is allocating 15,750 vaccines for Tulsa County to use next week. THD will use 8,000 doses for our operations and will deliver the rest to our healthcare system partners. THD continues to work with partners, healthcare partners to coordinate vaccines clinics specifically for Tulsa County residents, teachers and staff who are age 65 and older, licensed long-term care facilities who are not registered under the federal program and local church and community groups to provide more equitable access to the vaccine. Appointments are required to receive the vaccine at the THC vaccine clinic and must be scheduled using the Oklahoma vaccine portal at vaccinate.oklahoma.gov. A link is also available on our website. We typically add new appointments each Wednesday evening. We provide updates about new appointments on our social media platforms. So if you use social media, we encourage you to follow our Facebook and Twitter accounts for information. 
Last night, we had 4,885 new appointments in, in Tulsa County. That filled up, of course, very quickly. So we encourage you to continually check back frequently as ca cancellations do occur. If you are watching this now and have a loved one who you know will struggle with online signup, please reach out to them and offer to help them get signed up. Residents can also call 211 for assistance, but please be advised that high call volumes may make this challenging. The best place for information on the COVID-19 vaccine in Tulsa County is our website. Go to www.tulsa-health.org slash COVID vaccine to view the latest information. Follow us on Facebook and Twitter for updates. You can also call us at 918-582-9355 during regular business hours or call 211 at any time. We will continue to provide information on when the vaccine will be available to you once you return. The portal will continue to be used by local health departments to schedule appointments, but healthcare providers will use their own system to provide vaccine to their patients. Additionally, Walmart and some independent pharmacies will begin receiving vaccines from a partnership with the federal government. This program will begin next week and residents will be able to schedule appointments directly with these entities. The vaccine for these programs will come from the federal government and not out of our Tulsa County allotments of additional vaccine in Tulsa County, which is great news. Additionally, even more exciting news, Tulsa County will soon be the site of a megapod in partnership with state and federal officials, which will further increase access to vaccine. That pod will have a goal of at least 6,000 vaccines administered per day. THC continues to manage inventory for second doses. Everyone who receives their first dose vaccine from THC receives an appointment for their second dose. As the state allocates vaccine to Tulsa County, we first prioritize everyone who's due for their second dose to ensure they receive it on schedule. The remainder of the dose of the allocation is used to set new first dose appointments and to provide vaccine to our healthcare partners. It's recommended to return to the vaccine site where you received your first dose. This is due to second dose allocations being sent to that location for those who receive their first dose, they're ensuring that they have the second dose allocated. In the event you schedule an appointment for your second dose from THD, but you would, did not receive your first dose from THD, we will make every reasonable effort to ensure the correct vaccine, either Pfizer or Moderna, is available to you. If for some reason the vaccine you need is not available that day, we will provide information to you regarding how to access the correct vaccine. You may receive a phone call, email, or you receive information on this site. It's recommended to return as close as possible to the day of your, that your second dose is due. When you receive your first dose from THD, we schedule your second dose appointment for you at that time as the first dose. If a dose is administered after the recommended date, if it's a little bit late, it's still valid dose. So the first dose does not need to be repeated. But still, we, we recommend you come as close to that 21 or 28 day inter interval as possible. We all know that, that the Super Bowl is coming up this Sunday. COVID-19 continues to spread efficiently in our community. It's important to continue to practice social distancing, wearing masks and avoiding, avoiding crowds. I think most people know I'm, I'm a, a huge football fan and I'll be watching the Super Bowl at home with my wife and cheering for the Kansas City Chiefs this year since my Packers didn't make the game. You know, normally we have either attend or we have a big Super Bowl party, but this year that's not gonna happen. It'll be um, just ourselves at home to stay safe. So while the news about vaccine really is encouraging, the vast majority of Tulsa County residents have not yet received it and do not have the immune protection that, that it offers. This means that our tried and true uh, measures to prevent it are still critically important. The safest way to enjoy Super Bowl Sunday is at home with those who reside in your household. Gathering with anyone who does not live in your household carries risk and that continues. If you choose to take that risk, it's imperative to follow the three W's of prevention and wear your mask, wash your hands, and watch your distance by remaining at least six feet from others. Outdoor is safer than indoor, as we all know, but crowds of people are still concerning when it comes to transmission of this virus. Please make smart choices. We are still in the middle of a global pandemic. Cases remain high in Tulsa County. You can safely enjoy your favorite activities if you follow the three W's and put the health and safety of your family first. You've likely heard um, about these newer, more contagious strains of virus in, in this county. Two weeks ago, state epidemiologist, Dr. Jared Taylor said, and I'm quoting, to date, 
no significant presence of new variants of the COVID-19 virus has been confirmed by laboratory testing in Oklahoma. However, some initial test results have been identified that might be consistent with one of the new strains. State epi epidemiologists speculate that the UK strain is likely already pre present and circulating in Oklahoma as it's already been detected in other states with local transmission. This strain is more transmissible than the strain that has been in the US today and will likely sped, spread faster than the current strain. All the more reason to follow the three W's and to get vaccine when it's your turn. The more the vaccine uh, transmits, the more it replicates. And when it replicates, the chances for mutations occur. And that's how we get these different variants. So as the vaccine supply increases, we're able to administer it to more people. But realistically, it'll take it'll be more months um, before it's widely available to everyone and anyone who wants to receive it. Masking, hand washing, and social distancing remain critical. We are pleased to collaborate with local partners to increase the accessibility of, of the vaccine. Equitable access to the vaccine and information about the vaccine are vital to help our community end this pandemic. Our longtime community partner, the Oklahoma Caring Foundation, is using their mobile caring vans to distribute the vaccine to local churches, community centers, and school staff who are 65 and over. We are working with local community coalitions to provide information about the vaccine in more languages and to more community members. Federally qualified health centers, including Community Health Connection and Morton Comprehensive Health Services, are also receiving shipments of the vaccine and administering to eligible clients. At this time, I'd like to introduce past mayor, former mayor, and current Morton uh, CEO, Susan Savage. Susan? Thank you, Dr. Dart. Please stand by. We will now hear from Morton CEO, Susan Savage. Susan, you have the floor. Good afternoon. And I possibly am going to be redundant from um, previous comments. I couldn't hear any, anything that was being said. So I am going to just jump in here because I've been asked to speak about some of the strategies and challenges Morton is facing with um, trying to be part of the community-wide infrastructure to get people vaccinated. For your listening or viewing audience who may not know, Morton is a community health center also, also known as a federally qualified health center. What that means is that part of our mission is to serve the underserved. And as a community health center, we have um, six different locations throughout Tulsa and even as far north as Nowata County. As the state of Oklahoma has ramped up to make vaccines available to um, two community health centers, two F FQHCs. Morton has received really fewer than some others. And I have, um, as Dr. Dart knows and Mayor Bynum knows and, and Commissioner Keith, because I've spoken with each of them, really been working very hard to increase our supply and, as, because we have a lot of capacity here to vaccinate people who perhaps don't have um, as many options. Right now, we are working very closely with the Tulsa Health Department and with Life Senior to specifically focus on individuals who were 65 and older without internet. Last week, we were able to vaccinate 100 members of, um, of that population through Life Senior. A lot of mechanics there, but and I won't I won't get into that. Other than to say, per vaccine, the amount of organization and paperwork can range from twenty to thirty minutes per individual vaccine. So there is a lot of um, organization that's involved in it. And I'm very pleased to say, with our Life Senior partners, we last week uh, had a hundred vaccines available. This week. We are just going to start vaccinating additional individuals, I believe this afternoon, into tomorrow and through next week. We hope to do about another 100 to 200. We have a backlog of that population of about, 50, uh, excuse me, of, of nearly 1,000 people. 
So we're hoping to reach some of our underserved individuals who, who fit those eligibility criteria specifically. Morton, as part of a strategy, has also reached out and our main clinic here is located in the Lansing District to the many of the North Tulsa churches. I know the health department is doing this as well. Many of our faith leaders who have populations of people 65 and older, some of whom may, may be involved in healthcare. So we're going to piggyback on what the health department is doing uh, with some of the long-term relationships that we have with our faith leaders uh, because of Morton's history in our community. So we're working really to complement what others are doing. We are receiving right now about 500 vaccines a week, even though Monday we received 1,000, but we didn't know they were coming and some of them are first doses and some of them are second doses. So I continue to advocate on behalf of our patients and those in the community. It's a pretty confusing system. We're not part of the state's portal, so we simply try to pick up some of the slack. But among our patients in particular who may have chronic diseases, who may, who may have no health insurance, we're really using our transportation system, all of our available staff to individually reach out to those folks who are eligible and get them into Morton for their vaccine. Next week, or in the next couple of weeks, we're hoping we have worked, been working with oral health providers across the community to get many, and Delta Dental to get many of them vaccinated as well. Uh, Morton does have a dental clinic and our dentists are vaccinated, but we know oral health can be one of the most contagious forms of, of contagious spread in existence. So we're, we're going to be working with Delta Dental as part of a statewide strategy they have to reach some oral health providers. So our, our goal also, and I have spoken with Dr. Dart about this, is to, because Morton has clinical sites in every part of the city, we'd like to be able to start vaccinating the teachers. But I understand um, that only teachers who are 65 and older are eligible to be vaccinated right now. So at least I'm going to speak to our legislators about seeing how we might have, be able to assist in that effort to opening it up so our children and our grandchildren can get back to school. Um, I hope I have addressed, and I'm sorry again that I wasn't able to hear Dr. Dart's um, comments. But I'm gonna go ahead at this time and um, direct um, or introduce uh, Mayor G.T. Bynum for his remarks. And then hopefully we'll all be together as, uh, as we move down the list. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan, please stand by. And We now have Mayor G.T. Bynum. Mayor, you have the floor. Great, thank you very much. And uh, thank you, Mayor Savage. Uh, I'm so thankful for the work that Morton and other healthcare partners are doing in Tulsa County right now to help distribute this vaccine as quickly as we can. Uh, we, we have over 200 different healthcare partners who are signed up in our county to help us get this vaccine out there and in arms as quickly as possible. And each of them brings a unique skill set and definitely Morton has been helping uh, serve uh, some of our, our populations in Tulsa in greatest need of getting this vaccine. So thank you again, really do appreciate your work. Um, good news 
to start off with this week, we're seeing a positive trend in COVID hospitalizations in Tulsa. Uh, they peaked an all-time high back on January 11th at 468. And as of Tuesday, we were down to 267. So we're really back to levels that we haven't seen since the beginning of November. Uh, I think the work that Tulsans are doing to slow the spread of this virus, wearing masks, watching our distance, washing our hands, it's clearly making an impact. Um, I also think the further that we get away from the holidays when so many people traveled and gathered together with family and friends without masks on, uh, the more we get away from that, the more we see our hospitalization numbers improve. Now, this is a positive trend, but it's not a cause for celebration. Uh, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we can't let up in our effort to stamp out this virus. And the only way to do that is for our effort as a community to be unrelenting, uh, which leads me to this weekend. Uh, really a, an unofficial American holiday, Super Bowl Sunday. Uh, some of us uh, may be rooting for uh, the old guy, uh, Tom Brady, the GOAT, uh, while my kids, I know, and it sounds like Dr. Dart are rooting for uh, the, the young phenom, Patrick Mahomes, and uh, Chiefs offense that just can't be stopped. Uh, we'll be watching that and cheering on our mutual teams as a family at our house. And I encourage other Tulsans to do the same. Uh, let's not erase the progress that we've made in the last month. It's going to be a great game, but uh, no Super Bowl and definitely no Super Bowl party is worth risking your life and the lives of people that you care about. So let's keep it at home, as Dr. Dart mentioned, and, and everybody enjoy a great game on Sunday. When it comes to vaccinations, uh, I want to again thank uh, the State Department of Health, the Tulsa Health Department, all the healthcare partners who are helping to vaccinate Tulsans as quickly as they can. Right now, uh, Oklahoma actually ranks sixth in the nation uh, for the number of people who've received their first dose as a percentage of the population. And I think that says a lot, both about the team that is working so hard to get this distributed, but also about the seriousness of Oklahomans uh, who, are, who are being very diligent about getting this vaccine to protect themselves and their families. And now with this latest news about a, a federal megapod uh, coming here to Tulsa that could could administer uh, 6,000 doses a day or more. That's also very exciting. And I'm incredibly grateful for the federal, state, and local personnel who are working very hard, I know, right now to get that organized uh, and pulled together. I've heard some grumbling uh, from folks around the state about Tulsans showing up in their communities uh, to get the vaccine. To them, I would like to point out that here in Tulsa County, uh, over 8,000 Oklahomans have been vaccinated who don't live in Tulsa County. Uh, so we're all doing our part. As the state of Oklahoma has said from the beginning, these doses are for all Oklahomans and the location of distribution does not make it exclusive for the people who happen to live in that community. We're happy to welcome folks here to Tulsa to help them get vaccinated and we hope for the same hospitality in other communities if Tulsans uh, find an opportunity to get it quickly there. The goal here is for all of us here in our state to get this as quickly as we can. Uh, I want to thank State Senate President Pro Tem Greg Treat uh, and the members of the Oklahoma State Senate who yesterday passed a revision to the Oklahoma Open Meetings Act that would allow board meetings to occur virtually during an emergency. Um, we had this in the early going of the pandemic and then it expired and it requires uh, legislative authorization to do so moving forward. And, and we not only in Tulsa do we have a city council, but we have a lot of uh, really hundreds of Tulsans who serve on volunteer authorities and boards uh, to help govern our community. And we don't want those public servants to have to uh, risk their health to serve our community when they don't have to. And so 
uh, we believe that the Oklahoma State House of Representatives will take up this bill early next week, and our hope is uh, that the governor, uh, that it will pass there and that Governor Stitt will sign it and allow uh, local boards and authorities and city councils to meet virtually to protect the safety of everybody involved. Uh, at the city of Tulsa, uh, we just hired an emergency rental assistance program manager to oversee a new program that's being developed that'll aid households uh, who are unable to pay their rent and utilities. The program manager will work closely with local housing partners to distribute more than $12 million that's been awarded to the city of Tulsa by the federal government. And we'll have more information on that program and its details uh, in the days and weeks ahead. Lastly, uh, I wanna thank everyone who submitted a video for our Tulsa Thanks You project. Uh, the last day for submissions is Friday. Uh, anybody can submit a 15 second video thanking our healthcare heroes for the work that they're doing at cityoftulsa.org slash Tulsa Thanks You. Uh, our team at the city is going, our communication team is gonna cobble these videos together and we're partnering with hospitals so that they can be shown to healthcare professionals here in Tulsa and they can be reminded of just how much support and gratitude exists here in our city for the work that they do to save the lives of our neighbors. And I've seen a, a few videos that have been submitted uh, by kids in particular that are really wonderful. And I just can't wait for our healthcare professionals working the front lines and fighting this virus to see the gratitude that our city has for them. So to everyone who submitted one, thank you. And everyone who hasn't, uh, you've got about 24 hours. Please take a moment to record a video and send it in to let them know how much we appreciate them. And now I'd like to turn it over to my colleague from Tulsa County, Commissioner Karen Keith. Thank you, Mayor Bonham. Please stand by. Thank you. We now have Commissioner Karen Key. Karen, uh, you have the floor and David. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. And I'm going to work on one of those videos. And that is such a great idea. So um, again, you always you come up with some wonderful ideas because we all want to say how grateful we are to our frontline healthcare workers who are just working nonstop, you know, to help all of us get through this. So um, anyway, I'm really grateful. Um, so here's an update on some of the county CARES funding. We have approximately 13 million remaining from our original $114 million allocation. And the County Review Committee continues to judiciously gather information to prioritize the remaining needs as there's still more need than money available. In late January, we received an additional 7.67 million in CARES funding from the federal government for housing and utility assistance throughout Tulsa County. And as Mayor Bynum mentioned, the city of Tulsa also received direct funding for this specific effort. So the county's funding will be used to support the remaining nine municipalities within Tulsa County. We're currently working with the city to develop a program that will administer these funds and adhere to the same eligibility requirements to ensure consistency across all municipalities needing housing and utility assistance. And last Friday, January 29th, the Tulsa County District Court held a special criminal misdemeanor disposition docket at the Cox Convention Center, and thank you to their staff for helping us. And this is in an effort to remove a significant backlog from the docket due to the impacts of the pandemic. And the docket was successful and almost 200 cases were processed. Judge Moody has informed me that the space and social distancing requirements along with numerous hand sanitizing stations were implemented easily and that the docket ran incredibly smoothly. Tulsa County District Court plans to hold another docket at the same location on March 12th. More information will come out in the next few weeks directly from the District Court. Now in closing, I'd like to encourage all of you to get the COVID-19 vaccine when it's your turn. If your vaccine site is at Expo, on Monday it will get easier. 
for the next six to seven weeks, all the vaccinations will be inside the pavilion, allowing you to queue up in the outer bowl. So you will be inside and out of the weather. By the way, you can make life easier for everyone if you will come close to your appointed time, helping eliminate some of those longer lines. And as Dr. Dart said, more relief is on its way. Sand Springs Mayor and Pharmacist Jim Spoon says he and other pharmacies, they are geared up and ready to do those vaccinations. 150 pharmacies in Oklahoma will be getting 100 vaccines each week, and, and that will start by next Thursday or Friday. So check with your local pharmacy to see if they are participating and if that's an option for you. Now, remember, you can help save lives and stop the spread of this awful virus by continuing to wash your hands, watch your distance, and of course, wear your mask. So please stay safe. And I hope to see you soon. And don't forget to do your 15 second video and send that to the city of Tulsa and say thanks to all of our frontline workers. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Keith. Uh, please stand by while we bring everybody in for our uh, question and answer session. All right, thank you all. We will begin this question and answer session. The first question is from the Tulsa World for Dr. Dart. How many healthcare facilities registered to provide vaccines and how many actually are administering these shots? So we have um, in Tulsa County 253 providers um, who have registered through the, the federal federal portal. Uh, but of course, there's not enough vaccine yet to allocate to all those private providers. Besides us, um, there's, uh, our, of course, our, our healthcare systems, we already mentioned the um, FQHCs and OSU. So hopefully over time, as more al um, vaccine um, is allocated, we'll be able to ramp up distribution to those private providers and increase access points in Tulsa County. Uh, question from KWGS for Dr. Dart. Uh, can you talk more about the mega PODs? Uh, who are the partners? Uh, when will they start? Where will they be? And also the president said every state would have a dedicated FEMA contact for COVID response. Has Tulsa Health Department had contact with Oklahoma's? Yes, and that's and that's actually really the uh, what we're talking about is the, the FEMA FEMA pod. And um, of course, the pod here that we're discussing will be manned by, by the military and federal employees, but it's part of that, that FEMA plan. Um, we actually had our very first conversation about yesterday um, with the state, Tulsa and Oklahoma City. We've all agreed this is a, a tremendous resource that we want in our metro areas. So the planning is underway right now. We're in the process of selecting a site. Um, we don't have a, a time frame for when it will actually start. We have a meeting Monday and hopefully that, that timetable will be solidified on that. Um, on that day. Thank you, Dr. Dart. Uh, next question uh, from Channel 6 for uh, Dr. Dart. Are there any extra safety recommendations for bars and restaurants that are staying open on Super Bowl Sunday and rely on that income as it is arguably one of their most profitable days out of the year? So we know that, that we, we have broad and wide community spread in, in Tulsa County. We know that if you follow the three W's, it really increases your, your chance to be safe. And your um, so it's, I think it's important that, that business take place, but it's important to do it safely. And, and we've, we've seen that when people do that, the capability to transmit the virus is decreased exponentially. So if your business is there, please observe the recommendations. Customers observe the recommendations as well. If everybody's consistent in following the three W guidelines, we can get through Super Bowl weekend as safely as possible. Uh, a follow-up question to that from Channel 6. Um, is there a safe alternative to the big Super Bowl party for those who do plan to gather? Is, is there a safe way to handle it? How many should be there? How do you handle the traditional buffet food, things like that? So, you know, at these private gatherings, we're not recommending having any more, any more than 10. Um, frankly, it'd be best, as I said previously, to just have it within your own household members, not expand it beyond that. Um, if you do have 10 or more, of course, we still recommend if the weather's okay to be outside, do it outside if it's not indoors. Um, and then follow the three W's, masking, distancing, and hand washing. And 
but if you choose to have a gathering, please keep the number as low as possible and make sure that all your guests follow the, the 3W recommendation. Uh, uh, from Fox 23 for Dr. Dart, the last time we had a media availability, you said you were eagerly looking forward to the clinical trial results of the Johnson & Johnson single dose COVID vaccine. Even though efficiency is in the mid 60% range, are you still excited about it? And do you think the Johnson & Johnson vaccine still has a role to play in Tulsa County? You know, I, I absolutely do. And, and um, so far, really, it's, it's, I think 65% effectiveness on the variants is closer to 85% on the coronavirus that's currently circulating, which I think is very good news. And just from a logistical perspective, only having to administer one dose as opposed to two, um, will allow us to get vaccine out much, much quicker and, and vaccinate more people in, in, a, in a safe manner. So uh, we don't have a time frame for when that's going to be available, probably not until uh, late spring, or, um, early summer. But, you know, anything that, that we can help to make uh, vaccine um, trend easier to dis distribute, we we'd embrace it and looking forward to that opportunity when, when it comes. Thank you, Dr. Dart. Uh, Fox 23 for Mayor Bynum. Currently, there is a very public fight between Governor Stitt and the super, superintendent guest about when and how TPS should go back to in-person learning. What are your feelings on this feud as a TPS parent and leader of the city where TPS is in? Well, you know, I, I think one of the things that's important to acknowledge uh, is that the challenge that's been presented by this pandemic for public officials uh, is that it presents you with uh, really bad options a lot of the time um, and decisions that don't come with easy answers. And uh, I think a lot of the time when you have folks who are tasked with making those decisions, you can see it devolve into personal attacks, uh, which it shouldn't. Um, I think the, the, the debate between the governor and Dr. Gist uh, has taken on that kind of tone, which I don't think is productive. Um, first, I'd say Dr. Gist has dedicated her career to helping kids uh, and to suggest that she's motivated by subservience to teachers unions just doesn't stand up to even the most rudimentary review of her career. Uh, similarly, I don't think the governor is a bully. I think he's voicing the same concerns that I'm hearing from a lot of TPS parents over the last couple of months. Um, the parents that I'm hearing from, and I assume the governor is hearing from too, these aren't COVID denying anti-maskers. Uh, these are people who love Tulsa Public Schools, uh, people who've worked on campaigns to pass bond issues. Uh, they're the kind of parents who would have been cheering on Dr. Gist a few years ago when she marched to the state capitol to, to demand more funding. They are very dedicated to TPS. And they see kids for union and jinx back in the classroom, and they want their kids to have that same opportunity. And, and I also hear from them that they're very concerned about what TPS is going to look like on the other side of this pandemic when you have so many families uh, who can take an alternative are leaving the, the district. So, you know, on the substance of the issue, you know, I agree with the governor. Uh, I, I, I don't agree with the way he's chosen to convey his opinion. I, I wish he had shown the same obsessive focus on local decision-making when we needed his help to, get, to slow the spread of the virus with a mask order. But is he right that we need a plan to get back, kids back in school safely? Yeah. Um, and, and I think that my hope is that, that Dr. Gist and her team and her board uh, are, are working on that. Uh, we heard good news, I thought, earlier this week about their plans to, to escalate the, the opportunity to do that a little earlier than had originally been mentioned. And so my hope is that we can get there. Um, but. I think everyone involved needs to appreciate that school administrators at every level, uh, at every level of education, in every district, and in every school here in Tulsa, they have very hard decisions to make in the midst of this. Uh, but I, I also, again, I hear from a lot of parents with very heartfelt 
concerns uh, about TPS and a desire for their kids to have the same opportunity that kids in Union and Jinx have to be in a classroom right now. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, next question for Fox 23 for uh, Susan. Uh, at Morton, do you have to follow the state's vaccine plan when it comes to currently only being able to vaccinate those 65 and older, or do you as a community partner have a little more freedom to distrib distribute doses to those of need in the communities you serve? We've been, um, we've stayed as close as we can to the governor's plan. And, and I would say the general answer to that is yes. But there are some, there are some considerations that um, Morton has been able to make. For example, many of our frontline workers who work with um, people in our shelters who are currently being sheltered, we've been able to vaccinate some of those frontline workers. And that's been important to do because uh, they're dealing with very vulnerable populations. We are, I, I mentioned that we have some people with comorbidities or I, I may have mentioned, I couldn't hear other people's comments. Uh, in some cases, people who are disabled and need caretakers um, either they have physical or intellectual disabilities. We have been able and working sometimes with their providers and many of these individuals have, have comorbidities. They have diabetes, they may have cancer. And so we've been able to vaccinate some of those individuals um, and their caretakers as the needs have arisen. I really would love to see us be able to expand to Mayor Bynum's point the ability, you know, I sit here in, at the main clinic on Lansing, and as I count very easily, we have at least eight schools, maybe 10 within our striking distance. And we potentially could, could partner with the health department, with TPS to get those teachers vaccinated, and would love to do that. It's a supply and, and demand issue, but we can't vaccinate those teachers because it's not in phase two. I will tell you that's not the consistent, consistently the case, the interpretation of that in other parts of the state, some of the more rural areas, they've started vaccinating teachers. So it's, um, I think for us on the front line, we're really trying to make sure that we are consistent with the goals of our community um, the mayor, Dr. Dark, Commissioner Keith have done an extraordinary job of communicating the message, but it is confusing to the public when you, everyone is afraid of this virus and they all wish to be vaccinated. So just sitting here through this news conference, I've received half a dozen inquiries about whether or not someone could get vaccinated at Morton and what that, what that looks like. So we're going to, we're going to work within the guidelines. And um, when we, if we can make an exception, we're going to work with our public health leadership to discuss that before we do it. Thank you, Susan. Next question is from channel two for uh, Dr. Dart. Uh, are, is Tulsa Health Department aware of an event at Guts Church where a pastor tested positive for COVID afterwards? And was the safety plan for the event approved by the health department? And are you working with the church to con conduct contact tracing? So uh, yes, we are. We were not aware of the event until after it took place. Um, we, of course, we were made aware of it um, after uh, after it, it concluded. Our staff have been um, to the church, have talked with guts officials, and are working with them as we speak. Uh, question from Fox 23 for Dr. Dart. Have you received any further information about the local pharmacies that the Biden administration is reaching out to and how that will play out either in concert or in conflict with your operations at the fairgrounds? All we, all we know is really what I talked about earlier is that soon these independent pharmacies will, will begin to receive vaccine um, that we allocated from the Federal Reserve. So that's all we know now. Um, we're gonna, as I said, as part, we'll have a meeting Monday to talk about the Megapod. The conversation on pharmacies will be in that as well, but we know what's coming, which is great news for us. And, you know, we, we want as many access points here in Tulsa County to receive vaccine as possible. So anybody that is able to receive vaccine and 
distribute vaccine, we support that. Um, and we, we just want it to move faster than, than it currently is. And that's going to depend on vaccine being manufactured and, and sent all across the country. So all the states are really in the, in the same boat here. And, and we're all e eagerly waiting as much vaccine as we can possibly get. Thank you. Uh, Fox 23 for Dr. Dart. Next week, there is a chance for snow uh, and or ice in the Tulsa Metro. Is there a severe weather plan for those days? And what happens if you have to close up shop for a single day? You know, I'm, I'm um, so I have a little different, different perspective. I'm, I'm from a, a northern part of, of, um, uh, of our country. We're used to dealing with really adverse weather. I know we don't usually have that kind of, of weather here. So we pay very close attention to the weather. We, we have alternate plans in case we do have adverse weather, um, knowing that that's a possibility, it's wintertime. Um, so we, we want to be, be sensitive to, to all of our, our, our clients and patients who are coming to our pods. We want to have a, a way to serve them safely to make sure that, that there's no risk to them being there. So we are um, knowing that we're following the weather reports, knowing that next week could be one of those adverse events. And, and hopefully we'll have a plan in place that, that will step up and address that. But my perspective is that unless we get uh, blitz like we had 10 years ago, we're not canceling any of them. Thank you, Dr. Dart. Uh, Fox 23 for Mayor Bynum. The current Biden COVID relief plan going through Congress right now provides for $350 billion to municipal governments across the country to help with budget crunches and other needs. Are you hopeful Tulsa will get a piece of this and will any piece we get be enough to make a difference with the city's budget woes caused by COVID? Well, I mean, we're seeing, we just had a, a, discuss, a budget another budget meeting this week, looking at our latest projections. And right now, uh, the, the gap for our coming fiscal year between uh, our on ongoing expenditures and our projected revenue is about $10 million. Uh, and so that's a, a significant gap that's going to need to be addressed uh, by the council and I here in the next several months as we develop uh, our budget for the coming fiscal year. So yes, anything, any resources that could help uh, to fill that gap would, of course, uh, be useful. By the way, the things that are driving that gap, uh, a lot of it uh, would be costs of overtime to backfill positions when we have, uh, in particular, public safety personnel who are quarantined uh, due to the virus. Uh, we also uh, have public facilities here in Tulsa uh, like the BOK Center and the Convention Center that are reliant on ticket revenue to stay operational that haven't had uh, any regular uh, venue or events uh, on their schedule in about a year now. Uh, and those aren't things where you just turn off the lights and walk away. They require uh, airflow and security and other things that cost a lot of money every month when you're not generating any revenue at them. Uh, and, and we also have a, you know, a number of other uh, uh, sources of revenue that are just down because we're in the middle of a national recession and a, a national pandemic. So uh, it, it would absolutely be helpful. And I'm thankful that they're thinking about uh, local communities and, and how we can best serve people in the midst of uh, this really unprecedented time for our country. Thank you, Mayor Bino. Uh, Fox 23 for Commissioner Keith. Uh, there was a lot of praise for the nonviolent misdemeanor court docket that happened at the Cox Business Center last week. Do you know of when another docket could be set up like that at the Cox Business Center in the future? Yes, it's on March 5th. On March 5th, they'll be doing that again. So with all the same protocols in place. Thank you. Uh, KTUL for Dr. Dart. Uh, we are hearing from viewers who say they have friends not in the current phases who are able to get the vaccine. Have you heard of this? And are there loopholes in the process that need to be addressed? You know, we, we've heard a little bit of that. I mean, we're trying very hard to rigorously follow the phasing and the groups here in Tulsa County. And, and if you go through the, the vaccine portal, it is difficult, I think, to um, receive an appointment outside of the, of the phase and group that, that you should be in, but we're hearing that that, that has taken place. Um, and once again, not something that, that we, we want to see happen. 
Um, there's, they're, they're, these groups are faced for a reason and based on, on risk and infrastructure. It's important that we follow that grouping. So we'll continue to do that in Tulsa County and, and hopefully that, that's what's gonna happen across the rest of the state. Thank you, Dr. Dark. Uh, KWGS for uh, Susan. Uh, we've heard both statewide and nationally about how unequal the vaccine distribution has been for communities of color. How are we doing here locally? Do you see it improving and do we have any hard data? We see um, I, the, the data that I have relates to the initial distribution of vaccines and the mayor has heard me say this, certainly Dr. Dart and, and the commissioner. Um, Tulsa's community health centers received in the very initial distribution of vaccines, a total of 800. Oklahoma City's um, community health centers received about three times that amount. Some of the rural areas received three or four times that amount. So I have, have been um, a pretty, pretty consistent voice about the need to increase, if we're going to get the vaccine out, we need to increase the supply and the distribution to Tulsa. And that is beginning to happen. Uh, we have, have had, Morton has been able to receive more vaccines. The predictability of the supply and the consistency of its delivery is still not um, established with any great certainty. But it is better, and there seems to the lines of communication seem to be more open. I'm hopeful that uh, that that will continue to be the case. I do want to add to to what Dr. Dart was saying about um, some some variation. There's a lot of variation statewide about who gets vaccinated between the rural communities and the and the um, urban centers. With at least in the community health center world, but I will also tell you that every vial of vaccine has 10 doses in it. Sometimes you will get 11. And if you have a patient who fails to show because maybe they got the vaccine elsewhere and they didn't think to cancel their appointment, we're gonna keep a will call list and, and, and we're going to go through, and it may be that we end up vaccinating someone who's 64 or someone who works as a caretaker who's 38, because once that vial is open, those doses do only have a life of six hours, and we're going to get every single dose in every single arm, and that's what we've been doing. Thank you, Susan. Uh, KTL for Dr. Dart. What are your thoughts on pregnant women getting the COVID vaccine? Do you think it's safe? You know, the, the, the science has, has shown um, very much that it is. We, of course, we, we recommend that you have a conversation with your healthcare provider to ensure that, that there's agreement that if you are pregnant, you should receive that vaccine. But the data is showing, and the recommendation is for um, people who are pregnant to receive the vaccine, but always have that conversation with your healthcare provider. Make sure you're, you're on the same page as you go forward. Thank you. KTL for Dr. Dart. Governor Stitt said this week that he's working to get our summer back. Do you project this is possible in Tulsa County? You know, I think everybody wants their, their summer back. I, I, don't, I don't know a person who wouldn't. You know, it's going to be dependent on, on the feds getting us the vaccine so we can get it in people's arms and, and start to have natural herd immunity. And if, as Susan mentioned, uh, the more vaccine that comes, the more vaccine we can get out, the more people can be safe and, and protected. So um, if the feds are able to get us the vaccine, we will get in arms. And if that time frame is summer, Great. Um, you know, we were thinking worst case scenario, August, um, but we're working as hard as we can to, to ramp that up as fast as we can. Thank you. Uh, channel, channel two for uh, Mayor Bynum. Do you feel it's best practice, and, and Dr. Dart, excuse me, do you feel it's best practice to hold large indoor events yet? Is it aggravating to see some businesses, organizations not complying? Uh, well, I would say a couple of thoughts on that. One, uh, there shouldn't be any large scale events being held that don't have an approved safety plan from the Tulsa Health Department. Uh, that's part of uh, our laws that we have in place here in Tulsa uh, during the pandemic. 
Um, and the reality is the reason that we put that in place is because there's not any simple cookie cutter answer on that. It, it really depends on the venue, uh, how the event is conducted, and there are safe ways for uh, rather larger events to be held in the team at the Tulsa Health Department has been working with event organizers uh, to, to see to that. Um, if there are other events that are being held that don't have a safety plan, then we definitely want to know about that. And uh, both the health department uh, and our own city uh, working in neighborhoods team is empowered by the city council and myself uh, to enforce our ordinances and to cite any violators of it if they feel that's necessary. Thank you, Mayor Bonham. Our last question. Uh, I don't know if Dr. Dart wants to add anything to that. Just, just, no, you, you covered it very well, but you know, and I, I will say that, for example, Expo Square and the county have, has had large, large events and they, they've managed them very, very well. They follow their safety plans very closely. And I think it's a learned experience. You know, it's, it's a different way of doing business. Um, if you're sensitive to the fact that we're in a global pandemic and you create a plan and you follow rigorously, I think the outcomes have been very positive. So, you know, these plans do work. Um, we really applaud uh, Expo Square for the work that, that they've done. And we have other examples of, of uh, events that, that when they follow the, their, their own safety plan they create in conjunction with us, we have great outcomes. And, and so we continue to support that. Thank you, Dr. Dart. Uh, last question is from KTUL for Dr. Dart. Should someone who's had the virus and still has antibodies wait to get the vaccine so people without antibodies can get the vaccine or should they go ahead and get it? You know, since we're, since it's not a, an, an open call for vaccine, it's, it's we're vaccine and phasing in groups. I think regardless of your, your antibody status, when, when your turn comes up, get the vaccine. Um, it, it, create, it ensures that everybody is fully protected as opposed to partially protected. And that's what really the outcome that we want. So I think it's almost irrelevant if you've had uh, COVID before or not. We're, we're vaccinating, uh, vaccinating in groups and phasing. When your turn comes, let's get that, sh that vaccine into you to make sure that you're as protected as the person next to you. Thank you, Dr. Dart. Uh, that will wrap up our COVID-19 briefing for today. Thank you all for uh, joining us today, taking time out of your day. And uh, everybody have a good day. Thank you.